We're now ready to discuss the general solution of the wave equation, but I'm going to still uh, refer to this very specific case that we've begun to build over the last couple of videos. So we started with the classical wave equation. We invoked separation of variables to uh, generate two ordinary differential equations, one in the coordinate x and one in the coordinate t. We solved the one for x and we imposed boundary conditions for the uh, s vibrating string. So remember that was this this uh, thing here that could vibrate uh, back and forth, and that gave us this solution here for uh, x of x is equal to b sine of n pi x over l, where k is represented by that n pi over l, and that was something that was imposed by the boundary conditions uh, for the uh, string at point zero and point l, where it was equal to zero. We haven't looked yet at the time-dependent part, but I want to look at briefly at that. Okay, in this case, we have the following ordinary differential equation, which is only a little bit different from the one we saw for x. It's got this factor of v squared in here. All right, so since we're dealing with the square root of this thing that's out front here, that means that we're going to end up with a factor of kv, but since we have a negative sign here, remember this was an oscillatory solution, so the square root of alpha v squared is going to give us i times k times v, okay, where the i k comes from the alpha part and the v is just the square root of v squared. So now when I write down the solution for the time dependent part, I'll get a, something that looks like this, and I'm going to go ahead and put it in sine and cosine form uh, just to make things easier. So I'll have C cosine of K, V times K times T and D times sine of V times K times T. Now I haven't specified initial conditions, but I could specify initial conditions which would allow me to simplify this expression for T. But I'm going to do two things to simplify it first. Okay, the first thing I'm going to do is note that this combination of the velocity of the wave times k is in effect an angular velocity because it's, it's affecting how cosine changes with time or sine changes with time. So I'm going to basically say that this v times k is an angular velocity which I'll call omega. So in other words, I'll write this as cosine omega t and d sine omega t. But the other thing I'm going to do is say that the initial conditions somehow limit this so that it just ends up equaling cosine of omega t. Now this may feel like I'm cheating a little bit. I, I want to assure you that uh, uh, what I'm doing is legitimate. I'm just saying that I'm specifying the initial conditions in such a way that this is what the time dependence looks like. So what this means now that my general solution or for the full wave function, so that's u of x and t, is going to be the coordinate part, which is b sine of n pi x over l times the time-dependent part, which is just cosine of omega t. All right, so this is going to be my operating function uh, for uh, dealing with this uh, particular wave in this particular set of solutions. Now there's one thing I want to point out that I did not point out in the previous video, and that is that k depends upon n. Okay, it was written up here. So in other words, I really have k is really a function of n. So for each one, each possible value of n, I'm going to have a different um, factor there. The same is going to be true for omega. If omega is equal to v times k sub n, then what I really have is an omega that's a function of n. So in other words, the time-dependent part of each of these different possible solutions is going to be a little bit different because uh, it depends upon which of the solutions, that is, which value of n did we choose for this particular thing. Well, one of the things that we can um, indicate here is that the values of n represent different modes. And sometimes these are called normal modes, uh, but uh, that might be confusing later on when we talk about vibrational normal modes. I'll just say that these values of n represent different related solutions. They're different modes of the same solution, and that in fact a real general solution would be concocted by basically writing this as a sum over all the possible values of n. 
Okay, we start with one, go up to whatever number we want, and it will be B, and I'll make even that uh, subscript N, sine of N pi X over L cosine of omega sub N T. All right, so this would be the general solution for our wave equation for this string that's attached at two points, given an initial condition that simplifies the time-dependent part as I have. Now, what would this look like um, if I were to draw pictures? I'm going to draw several pictures. I'm going to try to make them as equal as I can so that we can really compare them. Okay, but I'm going to draw you different solutions of what this uh, what this should look like for different values of n. Well, for n is equal to 1, I'm going to have a very simple solution that's simply attached at the two boundaries and looks something like that. When n is equal to 2, all right, what that's doing is it's shortening the wavelength. So I'll end up with a solution that looks like this. It's still attached at the ends, but now it has a kink and it goes through zero. Okay, when n is equal to 3, it will have two of these kinks, like that. And when n is equal to 4, I'll have 3. So I'll end up with something that looks like this. Okay, the thing that's in common between all these solutions is that they all are stuck on the two endpoints where we have boundary conditions. So all of these solutions have to obey those boundary conditions. But uh, there are other things that we can uh, elicit from this that uh, are, I think, somewhat interesting. First of all, I want to define uh, a feature of these things called a node. And a node is a place where our solution u of x t is equal to zero. Okay, so I don't have any of those points here, but I have one of those points here. So there's one node in the n equals 2 solution. I have two points for n equals 3, so I have two nodes in this case. And for n equals 4, I have three nodes. So in general, I can say that the number of nodes for this particular solution is equal to the value of n minus 1, okay, just as a general rule. Now another thing I can say about as I'm going up to higher values of n is that this one has a period, or I say a wavelength, that would be equal to 2 times l, 3 times L, 2 times L. Okay, it would be two of the lengths of this box, because we're only seeing one half of the wave in that box. But we're seeing a whole wave in this box, so the wavelength for this particular solution is just L. I'm seeing a wavelength that goes from here to half of the box. So, I'm oh, sorry, from here to here, so that, so in fact, I have a wavelength here that's equal to uh, two-thirds L. And here I have a wavelength that's equal to L over 2. So in effect, what I have is my wavelength is going to be equal to 2L divided by the number n. So 2L over 1 is 2L, 2L over 2 is L, 2L over 3 is 2 thirds L, 2L over 4 is L over 2. So you can see that the wavelength shortens or decreases as n increases. What does the frequency of this wave look like? Well, nu does just the opposite of lambda it will increase so it gets more frequent, more oscillations, as n increases. Now you may wonder why am I uh, going on and on about all of this. Well these are features that we're going to see when we start looking at quantum solutions of uh, matter waves. 
uh, quantum solutions of, of atoms and molecules. And this whole business of how many nodes are in the function will turn out to be very important for a couple of reasons. One, it's associated with the energy of those functions. So the energy of uh, different particle states will depend upon the number of nodes. And in fact, it generally increases as the number of nodes increases. So this whole uh, exposition on the classical wave equation is not just a waste of time. It's really telling you something that will be very important as we move forward to learn more about how quantum mechanics and quantum theory influences our understanding of molecules and atoms.